Hello and welcome. In this video we'll be showcasing how easy it is to migrate a virtual machine from VMware vSphere to Proxmox virtual environment using Coriolis. Before diving into the demo itself, let's quickly go through a short introduction to Coriolis and its architecture. Coriolis was built back in 2016 with the main goal of preventing customers from succumbing to vendor lock-in. To this end, Coriolis offers both cloud migration and disaster recovery functionality from a wide variety of source and destination cloud platforms. Additionally, one of Coriolis's main design goals was scalability in order to easily accommodate customer use cases both small and large. As such, Coriolis features a microservice-based architecture with a number of independently scalable components working together to facilitate transfer operations. First, there's the API service, which offers an easy-to-consume HTTP-based REST API clients can tap into. Coriolis also comes with both a user-friendly command-line client and web-based graphical user interface to facilitate the creation and management of transfer operations. We'll be using the web-based graphical interface later in this video. When a request for a transfer operation is received by the REST API service, it will perform some upfront validation of both the request and whom is making it. The OpenStack Keystone service is what provides full multi-user and multi-tenancy capabilities to Coriolis, so you can safely isolate your transfer jobs between the different departments of your organization. Once a request is accepted, it is forwarded via AMQP to the Coriolis Conductor service, which saves the new transfer's definition within its database for persistence, and then splits the operation into smaller subtasks, which are then distributed across the various Coriolis worker services. The workers will then perform all the necessary operations on both the source and target platforms in order to facilitate the transfer. It's worth noting that Coriolis strictly leverages the source and target platforms as public APIs, so no invasive platform level access is required. Additionally, all transfer operations are performed using non-administrative user accounts whose credentials are securely stored within OpenStack's secret manager, Barbican. The code through which the worker services interact with the source and destination platforms comes as plugins, so a Coriolis installation can be tailor-made for the exact source and target you're dealing with. Once the transfer of a VM storage is completed, Coriolis will then proceed to define both the VM resource and any other supporting resources on the target platform before booting up the final VM. Given Coriolis's distributed nature, installing all of its components from scratch is not easy. This is why we usually ship Coriolis as an appliance in the form of a VM template with all of the services you see here pre-installed and pre-configured for you out of the box. The all-in-one appliance can be easily imported on either your source or target platform or an independent third location altogether. For this demo, I have pre-imported a Coriolis appliance on a source VMware vSphere 8.0. This is the appliance we'll be using for our demo today. Let's quickly log into it and see what's running within. The appliance is nothing more than an Ubuntu 2204 VM image with a pre-installed Docker daemon which is running all our services as Docker containers. We can see all of Coriolis's services we've mentioned previously, as well as all the supporting services like RabbitMQ for message queues, MariaDB for database, OpenStack Keystone for identity management, and OpenStack Barbican for secret management. Let's log into the Coriolis web UI and start adding our platforms and creating transfers. As mentioned, Coriolis leverages OpenStack's Keystone service for all of its multi-user and multi-tenancy needs. So the account we're logging into is actually an account managed by the Keystone service from within the Coriolis appliance. You can also configure Keystone to tap into your organization's Active Directory or other LDAP compatible identity provider if you so desire. After logging in, we're greeted with an overview page which will be showing all activities on the appliance at a glance. The first order of business will be defining so-called Coriolis cloud endpoints for both our source and target platforms. A Coriolis cloud endpoint is nothing more than a container for the credentials of the platforms you'd like to use Coriolis with. All the sensitive data is securely stored within OpenStack's Barbican Secret Manager, which is located on the appliance. 
As you can see, Coriolis supports a wide assortment of the most popular public and private cloud platforms, and support for custom platforms is easily implementable via its plugin model. In order to add our source vSphere A2.0, we can simply go into the endpoint section and add its connection details. Note that although we're using the vSphere administrator account, Coriolis works with any normal vSphere user account which is able to snapshot and export VM disks through change block tracking. Additionally, if you are not running a full vSphere deployment with a vCenter server available, Coriolis is also able to connect directly to individual ESXi hosts, but you will need to create a separate Coriolis endpoint for each one. Upon creating the endpoint, Coriolis will perform a quick round of validation to ensure the provided credentials are correct. Next, let's look at the destination Proxmox cluster we'll be migrating to. This is a simple three host cluster which is running Ceph for shared storage, but Coriolis can migrate to any storage implementation supported by Proxmox. After noting the Proxmox cluster's IP address, let's head back to the Coriolis UI in order to define our destination Proxmox cloud endpoint. For the purposes of this demo, we'll be simply using the PAM realm with the root user on our main cluster node. But note that Coriolis can connect to Proxmox both through the default PAM based realm, as well as PVE's own dedicated authentication implementation. Now that we've set up the endpoints for both our source and destination platforms, let's go ahead and define a transfer between them. Coriolis offers two main modes of operation. Coriolis migrations, which are one-shot lift and shift type operations of virtual machines between two platforms, and Coriolis replicas, the disaster recovery as a service feature, which performs incremental syncing of a source VM's disks to disks on a target platform, with the ability to recreate the VM on the target at any time later down the line, even if the source platform goes completely offline. While both modes of operation work very similarly under the hood, and require virtually the same set of parameters we'll be inputting shortly, for the purposes of this demo, we'll be showcasing the more granular Coriolis replica functionality. After selecting our source vSphere endpoint, we can specify a couple of parameters related to the export from VMware. Coriolis leverages VMware's change block tracking, or CBT technology, to snapshot and export the VM's data from the source vSphere. We can specify whether we'd like Coriolis to automatically enable CBT on our source VM for us, and also what compatibility mode we'd like Coriolis to perform the export under. In this case, we select 8.0, since that is the version of the ESXi hosts in our source vSphere cluster. Next, we are offered a list of virtual machines currently defined in our source VMware to select for replication. Coriolis supports migrating and replicating all of the major Linux distributions you can think of, including Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Oracle Linux, and more, as well as all the versions of Windows Client and Server which are actively supported by Microsoft. The VM we'll be replicating for this demo is this Ubuntu 2004 VM. Let's quickly log into it via the vSphere web console to check its current state. As we can see, this is a fully functioning Ubuntu 2004 installation. The only noteworthy aspect about it is that it has its root disk limited to 5GB in order to speed up parts of the upcoming demo, but Coriolis can replicate VMs of any size. Before replicating it, let's quickly create a file with a timestamp we can check for later on Proxmox. Note that we do not power off the source machine at this stage, and it will be happily running throughout the upcoming replication process. Switching back to the VM selection screen, let's search for our source VM by its name and select it. After selecting the Proxmox endpoint as our target, we are offered a set of options relating to how the VM will be replicated and deployed on the destination Proxmox cluster. Of note is the selection of the Proxmox node we'd like the VM to be replicated to, but there are numerous other aspects of the replication process which can be configured here. Everything from the model of the Proxmox VM's CPU, disk and network interfaces, to new credentials we'd like Coriolis to inject via cloud in it can be tweaked here to our leisure. For full details on all the available destination options, please review the official documentation of the Proxmox Coriolis plugin on our website. 
For this demo setup in particular, because our source vSphere and target Proxmox share the same L2 network, We'll be instructing Coriolis to assign new MAC addresses to the network interfaces of the replicated VM in order to avoid any MAC conflicts. Next comes the network mapping stage, where we must tell Coriolis which Proxmox VM bridges to attach the network interfaces of the replicated VM to. In this case, our source VM has a single network interface attached to the vSphere network named VM Network, which we will be mapping to the VM bridge named VMBR1 from our target Proxmox node. Following the network mapping stage is the storage mapping stage. In here we are given the option to map either whole data stores on the source vSphere to equivalent storage pools defined within the target Proxmox cluster, or to map each of the individual disks of the VM we are replicating to its own Proxmox storage pool. Next comes a section where we can upload custom user scripts for Coriolis to run within a replicated guest OS's root file system. As we'll be seeing shortly, Coriolis is capable of scanning and adapting, or morphing, the guest operating system of a VM it's replicating before starting it on the target platform. This process is referred to as the OS morphing stage, and it is the point where Coriolis installs all necessary drivers and integration tools within the replicated guest OS to ensure that it will run successfully on Proxmox. For this particular demo workload, there is no need to add any special steps at this stage, so we simply skip it. Because replicas are independent incremental syncs of a VM storage from the source platform to disks on the target platform, we can optionally schedule these syncs as often as we please. For example, we could have Coriolis perform a sync every Friday at 5 a.m., let's say, or any other cadence we'd like, but for the purpose of this demo, we'll skip the scheduling section as well. As a final step, we can review all of the settings of the replica we're about to create and go back and modify or add any we might have missed. Considering everything looks correct here, we can simply go ahead and click Finish to let Coriolis execute the replica. Now that we've defined our replica and the first replica execution is up and running, we can review all of the subtasks Coriolis will be performing. The first set of tasks read the state of the VM on the source vSphere and perform validation of the various inputs against both the source and target platforms. During the deploy replica disk stage, Coriolis will create new appropriately sized empty disks on the target Proxmox. Because the life cycle of Proxmox virtual disks are tied to a specific VM ID through their naming convention, Coriolis will automatically define and use a bare-bones disk management machine on Proxmox to act as a surrogate for any replicated disks. The disk management machine has ID 102 on our selected import node, and its existence will prevent any accidental disk cleanup while Coriolis is performing its transfer operations. The next set of tasks will deploy any temporary resources on both the source and target platforms which will be used during the replication process. Because the disk data from VMware will be exported from CBT, no temporary resources are required on the source vSphere. On the destination Proxmox, however, Coriolis will be creating a temporary Linux VM from a predefined template we set while creating the replica. This VM will have the replica disks attached to it and will be used to sync the VM's data. Note the replica disk attachment on the temporary Proxmox disk import machine. Once the temporary resources are all set up, Coriolis will create a snapshot of the source VM and sync its storage data from CBT to Proxmox. Note the creation of our VM snapshot on VMware. Additionally, note that Coriolis only syncs the allocated storage from the source VM, so despite our VM having a 5GB disk, the actual data being transferred is a bit less than that. The data transfer portion of this video has been sped up, but note that it only took Coriolis about 2.5 minutes to perform the initial transfer of the VM's storage. Transfer times can vary depending on the speed of the storage and the amount of network bandwidth between the source and target platforms, but Coriolis always tries to be as efficient as possible, even implementing its own novel transfer protocol and data compression techniques. After the transfer is completed, Coriolis will clean up the VM snapshot on the source VMware, as well as all the temporary resources it had created on Proxmox to import the data. 
Coriolis always cleans up after itself, even in the rare event of a failed transfer. It was designed to never leave resources behind. In order to showcase the incremental syncing capabilities of Coriolis replicas, let's switch back to the source machine and create a second file with another timestamp. Note that the source VM has been running throughout the transfer process. Coriolis was designed with minimizing impact to business continuity in mind, so it will not negatively affect the source workloads in any way during its transfers. After creating the second timestamp file, let's switch back to Coriolis and start a second execution of our replica. It's worth noting that we also have the option to have Coriolis automatically shut down the replicated VM on the source platform before syncing its data. The second replica execution portion of this demo video has been sped up as well, but note that Coriolis only had to incrementally sync a mere 5 megabytes or so during this process, which took it less than a second. The replica execution process can also be greatly sped up by having Coriolis maintain a number of pre-allocated virtual machines on Proxmox to use for the data importing process. This feature is referred to as Coriolis Minion Pools, but it was skipped for the purposes of this demo in order to make Coriolis's inner workings clearer to the viewer. Now that all our data is synced, let's have Coriolis deploy the replicated virtual machine on Proxmox. This process is referred to as creating a migration from the replica. We have the option of whether or not to clone the replicated Proxmox disks and boot the migrated VM from the clones. This will allow Coriolis to keep incrementally syncing to the original replica disks later, even after we deploy our new VM, so we leave this option selected. Like a replica, a migration action is divided into smaller subtasks. Note that some tasks of the replica deployment process have been sped up in the video in the interest of time. It's worth noting that none of the subtasks currently on your screen depend on the source platform in any way. So even if the source vSphere installation went completely offline, this replica deployment process could have still been executed without a problem. After the initial validation task, Coriolis will clone the replica disks by attaching them to a temporary Proxmox VM, which it will then perform a full clone of into a second VM. Note the Proxmox disk we've been syncing to was attached to the temporary VM before it was cloned. Both the temporary VM and its clone will be deleted as soon as the cloning process is completed, thus leaving behind a clone of our replica disk. Coriolis will next deploy a temporary Linux machine to which it will attach the clone disk. This is the machine which will be performing the OS morphing process. Note the clone Proxmox disk is now attached to the temporary OS morphing machine. As we can see, Coriolis has correctly identified our guest OS as an Ubuntu 2004. Because we are migrating away from VMware, Coriolis will automatically remove the VMware guest tools from the guest OS. After refreshing the apt package list, Coriolis will then also install both CloudInit and the Kimu guest agent within the migrated guest OS for full compatibility with Proxmox. Upon completing the OS morphing process, Coriolis will clean up the temporary OS morphing machine and then proceed to boot our final migrated VM on Proxmox. Note that ownership of the clone disk is moved to the final migrated Proxmox VM, thus tying the disk's lifecycle to the new VM moving forward. Coriolis will also wait for the Kimu guest agent from within the migrated VM to come online in order to ensure the guest OS has booted successfully. Now that the replica deployment process is completed, let's check in on our new migrated Proxbox machine. As we can see, our migrated VM has booted successfully and all its pre-transfer files are present as expected. Here's a quick look at the still running original VM on the source vSphere just to cross-reference our files' content. It's almost as if the migrated machine was created on Proxmox to begin with. Thank you very much for watching this demo. If you have any questions or would like to try out Coriolis for yourself, please contact us at cloudbase.it slash contact or click the link in the description below. We wish you all a pleasant migration.